Okay, welcome to the afternoon session. The first speaker is Rick Salmon. Um, his um, talk is on variational treatment of inertia gravity waves interacting with a quasi geostrophic mean flow. Thank you. That's okay. Which one of these doesn't work? Okay, good. Okay, well, that's, that's the long title. Uh, hmm. How do I? Let me see. Does it go? Full screen. Oh, I see that was just in the wrong room. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a theory for the interaction of a quasi-geostrophic mean flow and the field of inertia gravity waves. And the thing that puts us, a, a, the special features of this compared to other similar theories is that the mean flow really is quasi-geostrophic. It's not an ensemble average which could develop waves of its own. It's not certainly not a zonal average. And uh, the other special feature is this is an absolutely conservative theory in the sense that if the if the inertia gravity waves gain energy, it's because the quasi-geostrophy, quasi-geostrophic mean flow loses energy and vice versa. Energy is absolutely conserved, and so is everything else. And the reason for the conservation properties, of course, is that the theory is based upon a Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian uh, is, takes, uh, is composed of three pieces. There's a, a piece that involves uh, only the variables associated with the quasi-geostrophic mean flow. And there's a second piece that involves only the variables associated with the inertia gravity waves. So that this piece by itself just gives you quasi-geostrophic flow with no waves. This piece gives you waves with no quasi-geostrophic flow. And then this is the coupling Lagrangian, the one that couples the two together. And uh, I decided I'd give this talk backwards. I'd start by describing the final results. There's so many details to this, I didn't want to get bogged down. So I thought I'd give, I'd give the punchline of the talk, so to speak, uh, by explaining this more fully. And then I'd describe how you get started on it. And then I'd simply list all the things you have to do in between. I thought that would be more comprehensible. We'll see how it works. Uh, there are a lot of details to this. I won't be talking about them all. But you can get them uh, from two sources. One is a paper I wrote uh, a couple years ago. It's in JFM. There's another paper now that's been, it's under revision, actually. You can get that from my, my website if you, I can help you if you, if you want to. So let me go back to the, uh, this Lagrangian again and just talk about these three, three pieces in a little bit more detail. So the first one is the Lagrangian for the quasi-geostrophic flow by itself. And it's functionally dependent upon uh, three fields. One is the stream function for the quasi-geostrophic stream function. And the other two are a set of fluid particle labels that track and measure the quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity. And the Lagrangian for this piece itself takes the form of a recognizable kinetic energy, a recognizable available potential energy, and then some terms that aren't quite so obvious. And you obtain the quasi-geostrophic dynamics by varying this pair of particle labels and by varying the stream function, requiring this Lagrangian to be stationary with respect to those variations. And from the first two variations of the particle labels, you just get equations saying the labels are carried around by the uh, quasi-geostrophic uh, velocity. And by the third variation with respect to the stream function, you get an equation that relates the Jacobian of the two labeled variables to the quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity. And you can combine these three equations by taking the time derivative of this one and then using the Jacobian identity on, Jacobi identity on what you get from taking the time derivative of this, making use of these equations here, and you end up with the familiar equation for advection of quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity. So the next, the next piece 
of the general thing is a Lagrangian for the inertia gravity waves by themselves. And th th that's functionally dependent upon C and eta, the fluid particle displacements caused by the waves, and by uh, a Bernoulli function. These are all fast variables. Uh, the quasi-geostrophic dynamics was slow, slow ver everything there changes slowly. And uh, the Lagrangian for the waves, again, takes the form of a kinetic energy. The rotation comes in here. Uh, this is a, a form of the potential energy. And by varying these three fields, you get from the variation of the fluid particle displacements due to the waves, you get the, uh, the uh, uh, momentum equations in terms of these fast variables. And by varying the Bernoulli function, you get an equation that's really a combination of the hydrostatic law and the continuity equation. This is a good point, place to point out that z here doesn't mean z. Z is, in this concept, is actually buoyancy. But I call it z because although z is constant on a constant buoyancy surface, its value is the height of that surface in a state of rest. So it has that kind of. Uh, peculiar meaning. And now the more interesting part is the, the third part of the complete Lagrangian, the one that couples the fast and slow fields together. And this depends upon the slow variable, which is the quasi-geostrophic stream function, and the two fast variables, the fluid particle displacements due to the waves. And it takes the form of an integral of the slow quasi-geostrophic stream function times uh, three quadratic wave quantities. Uh, the one is recognizably the curl of the pseudo-momentum. And then there are others in addition. And so that uh, you, you could, for example, assume a slowly varying amplitude wave number frequency and evaluate these quadratic wave quant quantities more fully in terms of a phase average over the wave. But you don't need to. In fact, all that's been done to arrive at this point is to assume a, a separation of time scales between the quasi-geostrophic field, whose frequent, who it's, time, it's always slow compared to the rotation frequency, and the waves, inertia gravity waves, that always have a frequency higher than, than F sub naught. Um, if you assume no more than that separation in time scales, so that this is what you get, then this theory is equivalent to one that was published by my colleagues Greg Wagner and Bill Young last year. And that can be shown. It's somewhat arduous to show it, but the, the two are equivalent. And again, that's assuming nothing more than a separation in time scales. If you go to the other extreme, uh, what I call the WKB limit, and assume that there's a separation not only in time scales, but in link scales in x, y, and z as well, I, again, I call that the WKB limit, then most of this actually disappears. And the reason is that the curl of the pseudo-momentum involves just one outside derivative of a slowly varying wave quantity, whereas these other terms that are there in, in, more, in general involve two spatial derivatives of a slowly varying wave quantity. So they just go away. And in that limit, you, you recover a theory that was published by Oliver Bueller and Michael McIntyre almost 20 years ago. And then you can consider an intermediate limit where you're interested in waves that are near inertial in frequency. And near inertial waves have the property that they, rap they oscillate rapidly in time and also in z vertically. But they have very broad horizontal scales. So uh, if you want to consider near inertial motion, then you're justified in neglecting the z derivatives, well, this quantity here, because it involves only z derivatives, in this, in this piece of this quantity here. And in that limit, you get a, a results that are very close to those of uh, uh, Xi and Van Est, who just published a paper last year on, uh, also on uh, wave mean interactions for near inertial waves. And what's impressive about this agreement is all these three papers were all done by very uh, I would say mathematically powerful methods, but also very dissimilar ones. So the ability of this theory to uh, lead to this result, which recovers these as three special cases, shows that at least it's a good synthesis. Um, so the question is, how did I get to this result? 
Um, I could say a little bit more about the, quad, the WK limit, P limit. Uh, I don't think I will. I think I said enough. Uh, how did I get to, uh, to what I showed you? Well, the starting point for this was, uh, I think, newly discovered Lagrangian for the hydrostatic Boussinesq equations. And uh, this is it right here. And it depends upon five variables, two fields, the stream function C and gamma, whose time derivative is the velocity potential for the flow. There's a Bernoulli function again. And then there's the two labels for the potential vorticity. And what I'm claiming, and it's far from obvious to look at it, is that if you take the five equations that result from requiring this to be stationary with respect to the variation of these five variables, you get equations which are precisely equivalent to the uh, three-dimensional hydrostatic Boussinesq equations. And more specifically, from the variation of the stream function, you get an equation that relates the velocity to the potential vorticity in general, not just the quasi geography, but in general. If you vary gamma, you get an equation uh, we would recognize as the divergence equation. Uh, you vary the Bernoulli functional, you get the hydrostatic equation. And if you vary alpha and, or in beta, you get uh, essentially the equation for ejection of planetary of uh, potential vorticity. And so this is a, a logical starting point if somehow you've been able to find it. And the way you get from this to what I started by showing you is you take these five variables and divide them all up into slow and fast parts. Then uh, you keep only the quadratic terms and the fast parts. That's typical of wave, uh, wave interaction theory. Then you collect all the purely mean flow terms in one batch. And you neglect a term that would obviously be small if the mean flow changes slowly in time. That basically forces the mean flow to be quasi-geostrophic. Then you collect all the terms that just involve the wave variables in another batch. And you require that the uh, uh, potential vorticity be 0 for those fast variables. That gives you equations for the waves, which are incapable of developing a slow part. Okay, So you've now got that. Then you take everything that didn't fall into either of those two categories, and that becomes your coupling Lagrangian. And you treat that as small because of the mismatch in time scales between the slow and the fast motion. And so that then, then you can go ahead and use the leading order equations from the quasi-geostrophic set or the wave set to simplify the smaller of the three Lagrangians in such a way that you just get the simplest thing you can. And because all that's what eventually will come out when you're finally done fooling with it, you just take variations, what eventually will come out is guaranteed to, to maintain all the conservation laws because you haven't messed up any of the symmetries. So the connection was made. I forced it to be. I forced it to be. Uh, another question? Yeah. Um, you have two labels for the PV, or you get two kinds? Well, you need two labels for the PV because you're in two dimensions. And so you have to track two variables to be following a point. OK, now, now the question is, where did I get that? Because I really do think that's completely new. It's not related in any simple way that I can see to any of the previously published variational principles for fluid mechanics. And to explain how I got that, I'm going to go all the way back to the shallow water equations, which was the actual starting point for all this. And so oops. So there they are at the top. I think those are familiar form of the shallow water equations. Here, h hat is just h to, uh, scaled by the, the mean depth. Okay, So these general shallow water equations have a Hamiltonian formulation in terms of a Poisson bracket. Here, f could be anything. And the Hamiltonian, which is just the kinetic energy plus the potential energy for shallow water dynamics. And then what you can do is you just take this Hamiltonian, which is a cubic, because it's the depth times the square of the velocity. 
And you replace the depth in these two terms by its mean value, or its, the scale depth by unity. And you end up with a quadratic approximation to the shallow water energy. Then, if you combine this quadratic Hamiltonian with the exact uh, Poisson bracket for shallow water dynamics, you end up with a dynamics here, a reduced dynamics, uh, which differs from the full shallow water dynamics in the absence of this one half u squared term and in the fact that the continuity equation has been linearized. And uh, what's, what's beautiful about this is that in contrast to the full shallow water dynamics, if the vorticity vanishes, and that's possible, you could just say you started from that as an initial condition, then the equations are completely linear. And so what I'm going to try to attempt to convince you is there's a very strong analogy between these equations and the equations of classical electrodynamics in which the vorticity plays the role of electric charge. And if the vorticity is absent, you have linear waves that don't interact with each other, don't feel each other at all, in contrast to the real situation. But if the vorticity is present, then you have the possibility through waves interacting with vorticity. And so, uh, as I say, the, the striking thing about this approximation to shallow water dynamics is this very strong analogy with classical electrodynamics. And uh, the way that's discovered is to look at these equations the way you would look at Maxwell's equation. Um, think of these as the analog of the in homogeneous pair of Maxwell's equations. And think of this as the analog of the homogeneous Maxwell equations. Then what you can do, just carrying that last equation over to the next side, the way to thing to do now is to look at this equation, this approximation to the continuity equation, as a statement that a three-dimensional space-time divergence of a certain vector vanishes. Then you see the divergence of a vector means that that vector can be expressed as the curl of another vector. And so in this case, we have this vector of physical variables now being uh, expressed as a three-dimensional space-time curl of a vector, which I will eventually identify the first component as the electric potential and the other two components as the two components of the magnetic potential. So that's, that's one thing you can do to make that physics look like electrodynamics. Then the other thing you can do is to imagine the vorticity isn't continuously distributed, but imagine that it's, it's a sum of delta functions, just lumps, in which this, the strength of each point vortex represented by gamma sub i just corresponds to a fixed charge on the particle. Okay? Then you can realize that this representation isn't unique uh, because you can always add the gradient uh, of the potential or gradient of any function to it. And because the curl of the gradient is zero, there's an arbitrariness. There's a gauge uh, uh, arbitrariness associated with the identification of phi a and b. And that allows you to to make a gauge choice. And if you make the uh, standard choice of the Lorentz gauge, then it turns out that the approximate shallow water equations that I showed you on the previous slide just take the form of these equations. This one look, these two look just like what you get in electrodynamics. This is the wave equation for the electric potential. And it, this looks like the density of charge. This is the wave equation for the magnetic uh, uh, vector whose components would be A and B. And that just looks like charge density because of the uh, x sub i dot here. And then uh, the equations that say the point vortices just move at the flow at the speed of the fluid correspond to these two equations here. And these two equations, as I hope to convince you, are just the analogs of the Lorentz force law. And so once you've made that identification, you think, oh gosh, uh, there must be a variational principle resembling the one in electrodynamics that just gives this approximated shallow water dynamics. And uh, so you go looking for it, and it's very easy just to guess it. Here it is. 
that those approximate shallow water equations correspond to the stationary of, stationary of this Lagrangian. The first line of it involves only the fields, phi, A, and B. The second line it is, uh, involves a coupling between the fields and the locations of the point vortices. And I claim that this is very closely analogous to the Lagrangian for classical electrodynamics, which I just copied out of Landau and Lischitz here. And in fact, this term here involving it, the quadratic term and the fields by themselves is just analogous to this term. And this term here, which couples the fields to the charges, is analogous to this term here. A sub zero times J sub zero is just this term. A1 times J1 is this term. A2 times uh, J2 is that term. And the term that's missing in this analogy is the term that gives inertia to the electrons in electrodynamics. And so uh, you don't have that in fluid mechanics. And that's what accounts for the fact that the Lorentz force law uh, for the fluid is simpler than the one in electrodynamics. It only involves a first time derivative of point vortex locations and not a second time derivative, not an acceleration term. And so that gets you to that approximately shallow water equations. And then there's just a whole list of things. Most of them are fairly obvious um, to get you back to what I would call the midpoint of the talk, the place where I showed you the full Lagrangian that was equivalent to uh, three-dimensional hydrostatic Boussinex dynamics. And the steps involved are this. Play the same game, but just instead of doing it on the approximate linearized shallow water continuity equation, just do it on the exact shallow water continuity equation. So just represent this vector whose space-time divergence vanishes in the same way that I, I did the one that was only linear in the variables. That has the effect of turning this line of the Lagrangian into a nonlinear uh, functional of the fields. And that's fine, because all it means is something we already know, that in fluid dynamics, the waves interact with each other, not just with the electrons, with the, with the point vortices. Then what you can do is make the potential, make the vorticity continuous. And that just involves going back from a sum of delta functions to a continuously labeled uh, uh, field of vorticity. Adding the rotation is not difficult. And then for fluid dynamics, it seems to be advantageous to use the Coulomb gauge instead of the Lorentz gauge. This has the uh, interesting effect of kind of refocusing your tension from the momentum equations to the vorticity and the divergence equation. And finally, what you, what you have to do to get back to the, the midpoint of the talk is to uh, generalize from the shallow water case to the Boussinesque case. Well, that's very easy because if you write the Boussinesque equations out in buoyancy coordinates, which is essentially what I've done, there's a very strong analogy, as you probably know, with shallow water dynamics. So once you've got the shallow water, it's very easy to figure out what to do with the next step. And finally, you just you treat both the wave-wave uh, interactions that arise from the nonlinearities that will be present in this line after you do this, and the coupling between the waves and the vorticity, basically the Stokes drift of the point of the vortices due to the waves. You treat them as weak because of the mismatch in time scales, and that gets you to the theory I began my talk by just presenting you out of the blue. So. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, let me sum up by saying that the, electro, the analogy between three-dimensional hydrostatic Boussinesque dynamics is precise, except for two things. One is, and is that this line here is no longer just quadratic anymore. So let me go back to the exact case there. And so you see, this is with the Coulomb gauge rather than the Lorentz gauge. So it looks rather different anyway. But the point is, it's not just squares anymore. You've got a denominator. The denominator is unity to the extent that the isopictals aren't very uh, disturbed. 
that they're nearly flat. But it's this that makes the waves interact with themselves. Then this is the analog of the part of the electrodynamic Lagrangian where the point vortices interact with their fields. And again, the, telling, the thing that's missing from this is the, the, uh, the, in, the, in the electrodynamic, it's the integral along proper path of the, of the so it's the thing that gives you the uh, inertia. And so I would sum up by saying fluid dynamics is more complicated than electrodynamics because waves interact nonlinearly with each other and not just with vorticity, i.e. charge. On the other hand, it's simpler because vorticity doesn't have mass. And therefore, there's no uh, acceleration term in the Lorentz force law. And so um, what I like about this is it gives me a way to think about this whole business that clarifies a lot of things. For example, um, those nonlinear terms in the coupling, those, those terms in the coupling Lagrangian arrive from two places, from the nonlinearity in this, line, this field's only line of the Lagrangian, and basically in the Stokes drift of vortices that comes from this line. And so uh, it's as if you could create virtual vorticity out of the nonlinearity in here. And as long as the waves don't break or anything, it will just go away again. But if the waves break in the sense that dissipation actually removes energy, then the vorticity that's created, the virtual vorticity that's created by wave-wave interactions just gets permanently converted into real vorticity. And this is another way of looking at what people prefer to talk about is pseudo-momentum pseudo and the curl of pseudo-momentum and all this. This is another way of looking at all that, which at least to me is more um, transparent. So that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? It, this will give you the hydrostatic boost dynamics exactly. On your final slide, you had um, number six, which was uh, there. treat the wave-wave interactions. That's not to get the Lagrangian. That's to get from the Lagrangian to your, as yeah. you say, generalizations needed to get the hydrostatic Boussinesque Lagrangian. Right. This Lagrangian that you see at the top there, this thing here, is equivalent to these simplified shallow water yeah. dynamics. But do do you need to, do you really need to do six to get to the, the sixth thing you wrote? This is what. Oh, that's just a rehash. Of, so that of that's the not first to get that's talk. not to get yeah. to the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How do you incorporate viscosity and conductivity? You can't. You know, it's just it's. Once you're Hamiltonian, you just have to think of that as something that's outside the box. Well, uh, that would present a way of doing that for. Yeah, my view is the reason you want the you always want viscosity. It's going to be important, but the point is you want the you want the system you're considering to be such that if you turn the viscosity off, it conserves energy. If that isn't true, it means it's creating its own energy somehow, and then you're really in trouble. interaction between the geostrophic flow and the inertial gravity waves that you have seen in uh, simulations or observations? Well, I guess the honest answer is I don't know. You notice I'm not doing any calculations here. This is all just uh, what people have mostly done when they do this is WKB. And in WKB, this is all you get. In other words, the, uh, I'll go to it. Uh, all you get for the coupling of Grangian is the stream function times the curl of the pseudo momentum. And you can write that out. And inevitably, it's the action times the wave number. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of theory just stops at that, at that point. 
but it, especially if, for example, you're considering a more general type of waves in which there's no scale separation except in time, then you may have to consider these. And you especially have to consider this if you're considering waves that are near inertial. Uh, and Yeah, this is a hot topic now, the idea that uh, inertial waves may actually be a sink to quasi-geostrophic flow at large scales. The idea, I think, is pretty simple. Uh, an action conservation tells you that energy divided by frequency is conserved, and uh, the waves have F as their lowest frequency. So if they start there, their frequency can only get bigger. Therefore, their energy has to get bigger because E over omega has to stay constant. The energy has to come from somewhere, and so it comes out of the quasi-geostrophic flow. So there have been a number of papers lately on that. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Um, next speaker is Joel Somaria. Um, his talk will be on laboratory modeling of momentum transport by inertia gravity waves and eddies in the Antarctic circumpolar current. laboratory experiment. So it's the, the question of the momentum uh, transport in the Antarctic uh, circumpolar current, which is just uh, uh, azimuthal uh, flow circulating around the Earth in the Antarctic uh, Ocean. So here's the, the design point. So it's uh, driven by the, by the wind. And the question is to, does the wind pro provide the momentum? And uh, the question is, what is the influence of the bottom topography? Because this is a, an example of bottom topography uh, idealized in a numerical simulation by these authors, uh, Nick Rashi and, and uh, et al. And uh, so basically, the, the wind pro provide momentum and uh, there is a drag coming from the bottom and the idea is that there's some uh, gravity wave that can be emitted from the bottom and uh, transport momentum and the question is uh, in fact the, the direct effect of uh, the wave is uh, is not efficient because the wave are refracted they don't really reach the upper level so there's an idea that uh, there is a mechanism of transfer to uh, inertial waves that has been proposed. So this uh, is proposed by, uh, in particular by uh, these uh, authors. And uh, okay, and uh, these inertial waves are able to uh, uh, interact more efficiently with the current. But uh, this theory has been uh, proposed for 2D, 2D topography. So th this is why you, this motivated our uh, laboratory experiment using uh, 3D topography, which is more realistic. So the difference between uh, 2D and 3D topography is quite important because, uh, of course, in a 2D topography, the flow has to go above the topography. So it uh, enhances the production of, uh, of gravity waves. Uh, while uh, if you have a 3D topography, the, the flow can go around. And there is an old idea, uh, so-called dividing streamline idea, that the part of the flow can, be, can go uh, 
depending on the stratification, so namely on the Froude number, which uh, compare the stratification effect to the inertial effect, the flow can be uh, so. If the Froude number is uh, large enough, the flow is able to go above the topography and emit inertial waves. But if the Froude number is low, the idea is that the lower part cannot is not able to go above and go around topography, producing a vortex, vortex wake, while the uh, upper part defined by, uh, with the height, effective height proportional to the topography will uh, emit waves. Okay, and... Uh, This is an example of previous laboratory experiments on the topic. You see the emission of, of uh, internal wave by the topography. And the lower part here is, uh, does not produce internal waves. It, it's just a flow that goes around. So th this is a visualization, in fact, uh, of the density perturbation. Uh, the, this, uh, uh, However, uh, these experiments were done at a uh, fairly low Reynolds number, at fairly small scale, a few centimeters, and also confined laterally in a, in a channel. So this is what we wanted to repeat, this experiment at larger scale. And, uh, and also there is no Coriolis effect here, which of course is important for, uh, in relation with uh, just Antarctic uh, polar current. Ah, this problem. Uh, the So this is our experimental setup. So we, we use the Coriolis platform, the 13 meter in diameter, and we fill it with uh, water stratified density using uh, salinity. So typical water height is uh, close to one meter here. And the uh, topo topography is made of a spherical cap here. So in this case, there's one, we start with one cap to study the wake effect of single cap, and then we shall put uh, many caps to reproduce kind of uh, roughness effect. And uh, to produce the, the circular flow, we just change slightly of the rotation of the tank. So we can either start from rest and produce a small rotation. This produces a, 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 a mean flow, a constant, a solid body rotation around the tank. Or we start from a given rotation rate, and we change slightly the rotation rate to produce the, the flow in the rotation, uh, the rotating framework. Yeah. And we visualize the flow using a laser sheet. So we have a horizontal laser sheet, and we visualize the flow by a camera above, and using particles, seeding by small particles, we, we, we can deduce the velocity field by particle imaging velocimetry, just measuring the motion of particles. Okay. Okay, this is a uh, photograph of the setup with uh, multiple caps. See, this is a laser, the laser sheet system here. So you see the small particles. Here is the cut, the topography here. So you see the laser, uh, you see the particle streaks here. Uh, and uh, the laser sheet can be positioned at different heights, so we can uh, scan the whole uh, water height. Okay. Okay, the experimental parameters are typical uh, uh, are such that we reproduce basically the, the non-dimensional numbers of the ocean uh, situation with typically a uh, uh, topography of a few hundred meter height and a few kilometers in diameter. So, of course, the, the velocity is quite similar But of course, the buoyant field frequency is quite different. The size is different. But uh, the food number, which is imp the important parameter here, is the food number, is uh, bit slightly uh, around one. 
the smaller than one. And uh, also the Cauchy's parameter, uh, the ratio of Cauchy's parameter to the bond vessel frequency is uh, typically a zero four. Of course, the Reynolds number is much less than the notion, but still it's about uh, more than 10 to the fourth, so we, we still have a significant turbulent effect and instabilities. Uh, okay, so here is the result obtained uh, in the way we, we observe the way. The, the waves emitted the topographic waves. So we plot here the, the streamwise uh, velocity. So in fact, it's uh, it's uh, correspond to uh, cylindrical coordinates that we map. We rescale to look like uh, Cartesian geometry. So in fact, the, the velocity is uh, curved like that because of the circular geometry, but. Uh, we, we represent here the, the, ang the angle multiplied by the reference radius, which is the radius at the position of the topography, which is 4.5 meters from the center of the tank. Okay. And uh, he here we see the, so the, we, this is a fluctuation of velocity. We see clearly the, the waves, which are like, uh, so they propagate both, uh, of course, uh, horizontally. And, uh, and and vertically. This is with, without rotation, and with rotation we see an interesting effect uh, that is asymmetric. The, the one side is produce more uh, more wave activity than the other, which can be explained, but I don't have time to enter that, which is not the main topic. Um, now th this is a. So we made a cut here on, on the. Oh, oh I, uh, It's not the same here and here, right? <laughs> but it's. <laughs> It's okay, but uh, oh, it's a bien for me. Okay, good. Okay, so I made, I made a cut, cut along this line at different uh, levels. So we, we see the kind of vertical propagation. So this line corresponds to different vertical height. And we, we can deduce from that that the, we can, from this kind of plot, we can deduce the wavelength here. And we see that the wavelength scale. Uh, Increase when you increase the, the velocity, so you increase the fruit number. Uh, and uh, as I said, using this idea of uh, dividing streamline, we, uh, the idea is that we have the gap here, and only the upper part, when, when the fruit number is small, only the upper part is active, and the lower part is just used, uh, produce just a, a vorticity wake. And the, the, the height here is proportional to the fruit number. So in the case of low fruit number here, the active diameter is smaller, which explains that a smaller wavelength. But we see that for higher uh, fruit number, the whole uh, cap is uh, emit uh, waves. And, uh, but still, the wavelength here 
uh, increase when you increase the velocity. So probably the, the lower part is uh, the, the size, the effective size is increased by turbulent effect. That, uh, so the, the topography behaves like a bigger topography. And, uh, and from that, we, we can deduce the, okay, from the wavelength, we can deduce uh, a kind of uh, intrinsic frequency, and it's typical in uh, topographic waves. Huh? We have a mean flow, and the wave, in fact, propagates again the, the mean flow, so that it's a static uh, wave in the laboratory frame of reference. From that, we can deduce the uh, intrinsic frequency and the uh, angle of propagation. We, we find that the, basically the intrinsic frequency is close to n. In other words, the angle of propagation is close to uh, horizontal. In terms of the wave vector is close to horizontal. So now I, I come to the vortex part. So now we, we look at the lower layer, at 10 centimeters from the bottom, and we compare the case with no rotation here. And uh, we, we measure the, we plot here the vorticity obtained by the deviation of the velocity field. So here a small movie. So we, we see that in the absence of rotation, we just have a, a wave. Basically, the, the, the flow is blocked behind the, the island. While, while in the rotating case, it's more interesting. You, you get uh, Carmen Vorte Street. Uh, the, the, basically, uh, we can understand the difference by the fact that uh, in a purely stratified case with no rotation, the, the dissipation of energy is quite strong. So it prevents the, the emergence of these uh, vortices. While in the, in the case of uh, with rotation, we are closer to a geostrophic uh, situation which uh, dissipates less energy and uh, feature, the vortices can uh, develop. And this is uh, similar to what is observed in the uh, atmosphere. There are nice uh, photos from satellites in the, the wake of uh, islands. So now, now the, the, ma the main subject of interest is what is the effect of all that on the uh, geostrophic flow. Uh, so we now we, we switch to the case with uh, contains, and we look at the decay of the mean flow, so average downstream the topography in some uh, fairly large, large area. Uh, so we look at the effective decay of the mean flow. So uh, by a set, either, there is a set of uh, many waves that interact and also a set of uh, many uh, vortex waves in the lower part. And the effective uh, in the case with no rotation, uh, these are, are uh, but a different height here. This is uh, close to the bottom. We see a, a, a rapid decay, which is normal because we have a strong friction in the bottom. But the, lower, the upper part here remains with uh, Low, no decay. Basically, what is above the topography continues to flow with no decay, but what is uh, below the height, the, the top of the topography, decay fairly quickly. But the effect does not really significantly uh, alter the upper part. Um, well, as a remark, this is obtained, okay, it's not very nice here because. Uh, from practical reason, we, 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 the laser sheet is moved uh, at different, successively at different height. So we don't have a continuous record here at each height. So we have re effective record here and here, and then it's uh, connected by straight lines between the switch. So, uh, this is not real, this. Uh, so the, now, uh, with rotation, here we see a very different behavior. The whole uh, water column uh, decay uh, simultaneous, simultaneously. It means that uh, the effect of bottom reaches the whole water column. 
except on the very top here we, we see uh, okay is a little less uh, well at the beginning the, the whole water column decay in the same way with a typical uh, time, decay time scale here that can be estimated but the top the top level here uh, does not uh, the, after a while uh, does not uh, so the decay stop in the upper layer still uh, the effect uh, goes much uh, beyond the top of the topography so the then the idea is what is the mechanism which is different in the two cases Here, 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 there are some uh, measurement of local fluctuation, uh, turbulent, uh, renal stress, uh, TKE, but uh, I don't go to the detail. Just to say that it's fairly small. It's about 0, 0,1 uh, centimeter per second here. I, I come to that uh, later. Just to say it's fairly small. Although it is, uh, it exists. We, we do observe many fluctuations uh, to both the direct effect of uh, turbulent wake and possibly a wave breaking, but uh, we didn't analyze that in much detail. One problem we have in this experience, we did not measure the, the vertical ve velocity, which would be an important uh, parameter. But the problem we have to make choice, we don't have the direct measurement of vertical velocity. Here, okay, the, the time series showing the um, Uh, the decay, the main decay, and, and there is some f there are fluctuations, which can be, uh, which are mainly uh, associated with e the, the excitation of inertial waves. So these are, uh, so these are in fact the inertial gravity waves, but the, the wave vector is nearly vertical, such that uh, basically the frequency is, is uh, close to, to f, the coils parameter. In fact, we can analyze that uh, but better by filtering the signal uh, around this frequency. And we uh, do observe the two velocity components, U and V. We observe they are in quadrature corresponding to, uh, to the typical motion of inertial waves with the rotation, the rotation of the velocity field at a given position. So we do observe uh, inertial waves, but, st but still, Again, the, the value is uh, not very large, it's about 0.1 cm per second, 0.2. Uh, it's, enough, it's not enough to explain the, the decay, the observed decay. And, and this can be, can be estimated by this uh, argument here. We can take the Joseph Navier Stokes equation and we integrate them vertically. If you take a horizontal average here, so this is a, a Cartesian coordinate for simplicity, not, uh, not uh, circular. So the, the just the integral of the momentum equation from z net, any height z naught to the, the top. So the change by, by the renal stress and by the possibly by the effect of the transverse velocity uh, because by the Coriolis effect acting on the transverse velocity along y. In fact, in practice, this transverse velocity is due to uh, Ekman pumping effect. So because uh, you have the uh, geostrophic uh, flow, which is along x, so you have a transverse pressure gradient. Transverse pressure gradient in the lower part where friction occurs, uh, the, the geostrophic balance is no more, uh, uh, more achieved, and this transverse pressure gradient produces a transverse uh, velocity, which is the Ekman transverse velocity in the boundary layer uh, must return and, and produce this uh, uh, flow, uh, this uh, flow in the bulk. Transmit the effect of friction in the bulk, and uh, for, for, okay, and, and we can estimate that uh, by the if you, if we neglect this effect, we can estimate from the data here 
here we measure that. This is the decay time which is observed. Uh, basically, h multiplied by the azimuthal velocity. So the, the gravity is obtained as, as from the decay time that has been uh, measured. And we, we observe that to explain the decay, we, we need about here to have something like uh, one centimeter square per second, which is not clearly not observed in the experiment. So the, the effect of uh, wave breaking or wave transfer, which is included in this uh, Reynolds stress, is uh, too small to explain the, the decay. And uh, so we must, must take this into account. And this would explain why, why we observe an effective transfer in the rotate, rot rotating case and no transfer in the, in the non-rotating case. And uh, from uh, okay, and uh, and we can relate. Uh, so it's like uh, the system is like a turbulent Ekman layer, except that it's uh, the turbulence like, is, is a turbulence is uh, enhanced by a topographic effect. From uh, okay, and we know that we can relate the. Ekman pumping to the friction, to the effective friction uh, star square at the, uh, in the bottom. And this can be itself estimated by considering the, that each uh, topography produces a wake and, and um, block the flow with a, a cross section which is uh, typically HD over 2. Uh, H is the height of topography, D is its diameter. And uh, okay, but yeah, you can define a drag coefficient for each topography here, which is basically like a car, like a C. drag coefficient of uh, weight behind a car. You block the flow, and you, you have a drag force which is proportional to the square of the velocity and to the to the cross section. You see here an HD of uh, two. And, from, and n is the number of topography per unit of area. And from that, we can deduce a value of CD of 3, which means that the topography is, is, uh, has an effective uh, blocking effect, which is more than the geometrical uh, section, possibly because the. Okay. It produces a turbulence layer and okay, it seems that I don't know why <laughs> this is a result of the experiment. <laughs> but the, apparently the effective uh, drag effect of topography is fairly large. Okay. So um, But now, uh, something I, I don't have time to discuss is the fact that the, because of the density stratification, the Ekman pumping is blocked by stratification. Basically, so you, you have a uh, circulation flow, uh, a transverse flow in the, in the Ekman layer and uh, in the bulk. But uh, it, mean, it means that there's an upward flow somewhere and a downward flow uh, where. And, and this is blocked by stratification. But this occurs uh, only at fairly large uh, height, and, uh, which depends on the, on the horizontal scale of the system. But this has been studied, uh, this problem of uh, Ekman pumping in the presence of, of density stratification has been studied theoretically by uh, Wallin. And uh, there are some uh, available solutions. Uh, this result, in fact, in a vertical shear, basically the lower part is blocked by Ekman pumping, and the upper part remains. Uh, uh, the, the impact pumping does not reach the upper part of the flow. And I think that this probably explains the fact that the at the upper 
level is, uh, does not decay as much after uh, some time. And, uh, in the, um, and this, in turn, we, we'll, uh, we'll, if you wait long enough, it should uh, imply bulking instability because of vertical shear. And then the bulking instability allows to, to transfer back the potential energy to uh, kinetic energy. So this would be a mechanism of uh, energy dissipation. Uh, we wait longer, and, and it should be uh, it should also occur in the in the ocean. So the, this is the basic conclusion: is that the we do observe the excitation of inertial oscillations, but they are not sufficient to explain the observed decay with the rotation. And use that it should be due to this uh, Ekman pumping effect. And also, the mechanism for uh, momentum transport in the Antarctic Ocean. When you study the flow over the topography, you model the topography by a collection of mountains, yes. which are on a triangular lattice. And this lattice has a given wavelength. Uh, so how did you pick up these wavelengths, and how does it compare to the wavelengths of the waves emitted by a single mountain? Ah, yes, but typically we... Yeah, you... Did, did, did you try to be... It's about the... We wanted to have uh, fairly close, close tracking, but uh, so typical wavelength is of the order of the twice the diameter, diameter of the topography. I, I, there is no, there is no very strong reason for that. <laughs> in, in the real ocean, for example, in numerical simulation, people use random, uh, random spectra of topography, with, which are mimic more or less the, the observed uh, topography in the. Of the shell, but there are many possibilities of topography depending on the, on the location. We, we did this choice, but is not uh, we have not had very strong reason uh, for the. <laughs> of course, we want something fairly close, but still the uh, we, we want the wake to of each individual topography to develop by itself. Or you didn't try to achieve resonance, for example. But all that is quite turbulent, so there's no real resonance. Ah, I mean, uh, with uh, with uh, the um, emission of uh, Carmen Vortex Street, you may have resonance effect, yes. Uh, we didn't try, no. Yes, it would be a good idea to try to match the distance with respect to the Carmen Vortex Street. It's uh, interesting, but talk on nonlinear and magnetic effects on dynamical tides. So I report some of my recent work, uh, helical wave dynamo, precession convection dynamo, oblique rotator, and dynamical tide. Um, <coughs> so four small exercises. So. Yeah. 
So the first problem is the kinematic dynamo induced by helical waves. And the second is dynamo driven by combined effect of precession and convection. That's applied for the Earth. The third is oblique rotator problem for uniform rotation in solar radiation zone. That's for the sun. Uh, the fourth is magnetic and nonlinear effects on dynamical tides. That's for the binary stars. So we begin with the first problem, kinematic dynamo induced by helical waves. It's a very simple uh, calculation to review some physics of the uh, dynamo action. So the motivation, all, <coughs> all celestial bodies rotate. Uh, so Crowley's force uh, induce helical waves. And we know helical waves twist magnetic field lines. That's the alpha effect. And to better understand this alpha effect, we study the dynamo induced by helical waves. Uh, that's the equation we solve. It's kinematic dynamo. We don't have the number stokes equation, just the induction equation. And velocity u is prescribed. We use the superposition of two helical waves, u1 and u2. Uh, u1 is helical wave. The phase velocity is in the x1 direction, and u2. And the phase velocity is in x2 direction. So both u1 and u2 are helical waves. So the definition of helical waves is there. Uh, so it's alpha square dynamo. So u1 twist magnetic field lines in the x2, x3 plan. And u, u2 twist field lines in the x3, x1 plan to generate the dynamo. It's very simple, uh, alpha square dynamo model and the result. So at two uh, magnetic parental numbers, the left panel and the right panel, and the vertical axis is the growth rate of the magnetic energy. The horizontal axis is the wave number. Uh, the result is clear that there is the optimal wave number. Correspond <coughs> this optimal wave number corresponds to the uh, maximum growth rate. Uh, so we explain this result, why there is the peak uh, for the dynamo action. So we perturb the equation of magnetic field and calculate the EMF. And that's the expression of the EMF. Uh, we see that uh, it's, uh, the denominator is k cube. Denominator is k fourth, k to the fourth plus constant. Constant depends on the uh, wave frequency. And so this expression has the maximum. So the EMF reaches the maximum at this optimal wave number. And this optimal, uh, this wave number is approximately equal to the optimal wave number in the numerical results. So we can estimate the optimal wave number by, by this simple expression. And uh, the estimation is consistent with the uh, numerical results here. So that's the interpretation for this optimal wave number. So the summary, there exists an optimal wave number for dynamo because EMF reaches its maximum at this optimal wave number. And the result can be applied to turbulent dynamo. So neither too large nor too small size of turbulent eddies is good to dynamo, but the intermediate size is good. And we can estimate uh, the optimal size by that expression. We plug in the Reynolds, the magnetic Reynolds number, the frequency, and we calculate the uh, optimal size of turbulent eddies. So that's the first uh, the first problem. It's very simple kinematic dynamo calculation. And the second is dynamo driven by combined effect of precession and convection. That's for the Earth. And so the motivation, okay, dynamo we know, uh, shears and twists magnetic field lines to generate new lines. And Earth magnetic field uh, is believed to be generated by convection motion in the liquid iron in the fluid core. And convection dynamo has been extensively studied since 1950s. But convection could be not powerful enough to, to generate Earth magnetic field. Uh, so Peter Olson did some experiment. And to ma uh, the he argued that thermal conductivity is not is is too high, such that convection could be not powerful enough. And alternatively, precession can drive dynamo. 
So Marcus did this experiment and argued that precession can drive dynamo. And then how about the combined effect of convection and precession? So we study by two steps. The first step, the first step is the hydrodynamics without magnetic field. Uh, so we write down the equation of fluid motion in the frame uh, attached to the boundary. So we see the two dimensionless numbers. Poincaré number measures the strength of precession. Really number measures the strength of the convection. So the story is about the computation between Poincaré number and the really number. And we also have the temperature equation. Uh, we show the result. So the neutral stability curve, vertical axis is the really number, horizontal axis is Poincaré number. So uh, there is the minimum. So the, uh, the neutral stability curve is not monotonic. That means there exists the resonance between the thermal instability and precessional instability. So convection and precession destabilize each other. Uh, that means in the presence of both convection and precession fl flow tends to become more unstable than each of them alone because of the tried resonance uh, mechanism. Uh, we know that flow instabilities are good to the dynamo. And so next step is to involve the magnetic field. So the blue terms are uh, arise from magnetic field. The Lorentz force and the magnetic induction equation. And so we see the result. So the first, <coughs> so we say Poincaré number, really number. So the first two rows are the purely convective flow. So at really number 0.5, we don't have dynamo. At 0.6, we have dynamo. The next two rows are purely processing flow. Uh, at Poincaré number 0.2, we don't have dynamo. Oh, Poincaré number is negative because it's retrograde. Um, at point three, we have dynamo. Then the last row shows the precession convection dynamo. At Poincaré number point two, really number point five, we have dynamo. And it's very interesting that we, we see the third column. Uh, so we see that the RM of precession convection dynamo is even lower than the field convection dynamo. So that means there is there is some non-trivial effect of precession convection dynamo. So that's the result. Oh, okay. In the calculations, I also find that precession can make the dipole reversals less frequent. That means precession can modulate the frequent precession, uh, fr 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 frequent dipole reversals of the purely convective flow. That's also the one of results. Uh, so result because flow tends to be more unstable, the combined effect of convection precession facilitates dynamo. Although convection or precession alone cannot drive dynamo with weak strength, the combined effect can drive dynamo. And so, so combined effect. Wait, do a summary. Combined effect of precession convection makes flow more unstable and combined effect of precession and convection facilities dynamo. So this work implies the importance of precession for the Earth magnetic field. For example, we know the Marshall dynamo stopped uh, because Mars has no precession. But Earth has a long history of dynamo action. And maybe it is because of the precession of the Earth. Tentative conjecture. So the third problem is the oblique rotator problem for the uniform rotation in the solar radiation zone. Um, so, motivation. Why does the solar radiation zone rotate uniformly? It's an unsolved problem in the solar physics. So we have a working hypothesis here. The uniform rotation arises from the angular momentum transfer due to an oblique magnetic field. We suppose that magnetic fields generated in convection zone penetrate into the radiation zone because of the finite conductivity of the radiation zone. And so then we study the interaction of differential rotation and the misaligned magnetic field. That's the oblique rotator problem. So here is the picture for the oblique rotator. So rotation axis 
and magnetic axis, they have an angle. And so they write down equations. So equation of fluid motion, Navier-Stokes equation, and equation of a magnetic field. And we give the initial velocity and the initial magnetic field. Initial velocity has the differential rotation. So that the idea is we impose a differential rotation and we impose initial uh, misaligned magnetic field. Alpha is the angle between the rotation axis and magnetic axis. So we say how they involve. That's the basic idea. So H is the potential scalar potential of polyoidal field. It measures the strength of the uh, initial magnetic field. So VA is the dimension is R and velocity. So it's the relative strength of the magnetic field to uh, rotation. So we see the results. So the top row shows the three uh, components of magnetic field at initial. So it's uh, 45, uh, okay, we give alpha, 45 degree. So, and the bottom row shows the ma three components of magnetic field after some time, after some differential rotation. So differential rotation acts on the magnetic field lines. So that's the winding up process. So we can see magnetic field lines become uh, more and more tightened because of the differential rotation. And the small uh, field become a uh, field, magnetic field has uh, smaller and smaller scales such that dissipation becomes stronger and stronger. So that's the basic idea of this uh, problem. So that's the winding up. And uh, okay, we, we don't show the details. We just give the summary. So rotation and magnetic field compete against each other. And BP sine alpha does matter to this computation. BP is the polyoid field. Alpha is the angle between the rotation and the magnetic field. So BP sine alpha is very important for this computation. If differential rotation dominates over field, then the field becomes axis symmetric because of the winding up, because non-axis symmetry component dissipates very quickly. And the decay time follows uh, one third row, one third law of the uh, this RRM to the one third. On the contrary, if field dominates over rotation, uh, rotation becomes uniform because of the angular momentum transfer by the Arvin wave propagation. That's the so-called phase mixing mechanism. So in the solar radiation zone, we can estimate BP sine alpha is large enough such that rotation becomes uniform. That's the hypothesis. So because field dominates over rotation, so differential rotation disappears because of the Arvin wave propagation to make, uh, to, to have the phase mixing. Okay, so the fourth problem is magnetic and nonlinear effects on dynamical tides. Uh, so the picture is the binary neutron stars. Okay, we have two concepts. So static tide, the primary is gravitationally perturbed by its companion, such that a bar of the primary points to the companion. It's a large scale motion that's called static tide. And dynamical tide, Fluid internal waves are excited by the periodical tidal force. If the tidal frequency is close to the eigenfrequency of fluid wave, then the resonance occurs. That's the tidal, dissipa tidal <coughs> dynamical tide. And the tidal dissipation comes mainly from a dynamical tide because waves have very small scales. So, uh, so the study of this uh, problem has a long history. So Cowling uh, uh, started this uh, study of stellar dynamical tide. And Zah Godrek studied the internal gravity wave due to the st stratification. And Goodman and Ogilvy studied the inertial wave due to rotation. Inertial wave is more difficult than the internal gravity wave because rotation breaks the symmetry, the spherical symmetry such that uh, the problem of inertial wave is a 2D uh, problem. And so, however, both magnetic and nonlinear effects on dynamical tide are unknown. Uh, so for the ma magnetic effect, I did a linear calculation for the rotating MHD flow with the WKB approximation. So that we assume the length, <coughs> length scale of the imposed field 
is large compared to the length scale of the perturbation. So we use the WKB approximation. And for the nonlinear effect, I did numerical calculations for the rotating flow. For, for this, I, did, I didn't involve the magnetic field. I only focused on the uh, flow. So OK, magnetic effect. So we perturb the uh, Navier-Stokes equation and the uh, induction equation. So F is the tidal force. Uh, we assume uh, a tidal force uh, to have the plane wave expression. It's a linear problem, so we assume the solution to follow the Fourier plane wave. And we plug in the solution, we plug the solution into the uh, equations, we can derive the WKB solution here. Uh, so U hat is the tidal response, F, ta F hat is the tidal amplitude, complex amplitude, and omega is tidal frequency. Omega omega is the frequency of inertial wave. Omega B is the frequency of urban wave. Uh, viscosity nu is viscosity eta is magnetic repulsivity. So resonance occurs when the denom denominator is zero. Without viscosity and magnetic repulsivity, we derive this equation. So the red term uh, is the magnetic effect. If we don't have magnetic effect, if we don't have magnetic field, it's the inertial wave. If we have magnetic field, it's a quadratic equation. So the two solutions are the magneto inertial wave. So, so the result, magnetic field splits the resonant frequency from one frequency of inertial wave to the two frequency of the magneto inertial wave. The left traveling wave dissipates much faster than the right traveling wave. I did some calculations to find this. Bec uh, that means the magnetic field breaks the asymmetry. And when the Lunar number, Lunar number measures the relative strength of magnetic field to the rotation. When Lunar number is larger than 10 to minus 3, for example, in the compact objects in white dwarf or neutron star, uh, magnetic field is pretty strong, so Lunar number is very high. So the ohmic dissipation dominates over viscous dissipation. So that means in the tidal dissipation, ohmic dissipation could be very important, more important than the viscous dissipation even at a very small magnetic field. So, so the result is, although magnetic pressure is negligible compared to the thermal pressure for static balance at zeroth order, the magnetic field is significant for the dynamical time at the first order perturbation. So that, that's the conclusion. And for the nonlinear effect, uh, for simplicity, I didn't consider the magnetic field. I studied only this uh, rotating flow. Uh, so I study the red term, so nonlinear inertial force with and without this term, what will happen? I just show the result. In the linear regime, tidal dissipation at resonance scales as ECMA number minus one, K minus two. It's opposite to the intuition because usually uh, dissipation is proportional to ECMA number viscosity and proportional to K square. But at resonance, it's inversely proportional to ECMA number and k square because the velocity, I mean the tidal, dis tidal response at resonance is inversely proportional to ECMA number and uh, k square. So that's the reason. The nonlinear effect surprises the tidal dissipation at the resonant frequency, but is negligible at frequency far away from the resonant frequency. That's reasonable because response is strong in the former, but weak in the latter. So this nonlinear result implies that the previous linear calculations overestimated the tidal response and dissipation at the resonant frequency. So that, that's the result. Uh, summary. Magnetic field splits the resonant frequency such that resonance is more likely to occur. Uh, so the resonant frequencies are broadened by the magnetic field. And ohmic dissipation can dominate over viscous dissipation, even at a weak field. Nonlinear effect surprises tidal dissipation near the resonant frequency. So neither is negligible for the study of dynamical time. So that's, that's all.
you had that, the, uh, there was a preferred scale for the uh, wavelength of the helical waves. Yep. But does, does the scale of the magnetic field that you generate change as, like you, as you change K, on on K and with one. RM? It's always on K equals 1. Even always on the larger scale, even at high RM? E even at high RM and high, high K, if I get very, very high K and very high K. So I think mean field theory does matter here. Does so you get no small scale dynamo, it's all a large scale dynamo. Yeah, on very large scale. But, surprising. Uh, but, but RM is not very high, I think I increase RM, so I can't remember. Maybe so Is this RM on the scale of the, on the scale of the box or on the scale of on the, the scale of helix? Ah, box. okay. It's pretty high, I think. The this definition okay. is on the box, so here, array is the bo box size. Right, so, so RM on the scale of the helical wave is, is going to be very small. RM is, you can say, 20 and 50. Right, uh, and the wave number is 15 and Oh, yes, 40, so um, um, yes, wave so number is, if you, uh, yeah, 60, yes. So it yeah. picks the one where RM on the scale of the wave is 1. E about yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. So, data. So, um, do you uh, do you need need a minimum amplitude of magnetic field? To to have the solid rotation. You mean the third problem. Solid rotation of the core. Oh, you so mean this oblique rotator explanation. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So I need what? Sorry. Can you? You need a minimum amplitude of the magnetic field. N no, the the result is a field is okay. A field is weak. Rotation will <coughs> okay. Field will becomes uh, will become axisymmetric because because of the winding up. Because field becomes smaller and smaller, so dissipation becomes stronger and stronger. If field is strong, uh, so differential rotation disappears. So the criteria is BP sine alpha. So that, that's the. Okay. 